And when you're reading, John, is your mind continually snagging on little details and sort of thinking, well, that doesn't, that, that would repay closer investigation. Is that how your mind works? Yeah, one of the nice things about, about, about sort of uh, reading, of course, is that it, it defines you as much as informing you anything about the world outside. And, you know, I think that I'm, I've always been a, a rather kind of literal reader and, you know, always worried about what's going on in the background of, of novels. I mean, so I said the fact is, not, you know, fiction, particularly novels, are, are very real to me. And, and you know, so sort of I wonder, I do wonder what's happening you know, behind the narrative, you know, which you're not supposed to do nowadays, or, in fact, you know, ever since we were taught how to read in universities just to pay attention to the words on the page. There's nothing outside the text, as the, mm. um, as the deconstructionists say. Mm. Well, for me, there's an awful lot outside the text. You know, I'm quite curious to know about you know, you know, what Dorothy Brook was doing when she was a schoolgirl and that kind of thing. And you clearly revel in the, the sort of messiness of authors' lives, their transgressions, their peccadilloes, their foibles, and that's, that's grist to a mill. Yeah, I know. You know, they, we, one tends to deify them in a sense. You know, they're very great people, but in fact, in some ways, they're rather imperfect people. Mm. You, you know, rather like academic life, which is a selection process for neurotics <laughs> and people who couldn't otherwise make their way in the world. I mean, you've got to go through a, to any English department and realise it's a bit like sort of one flew over the cuckoo's nest. But mm. the um, I think it's the same with writers. I mean, right, writers. Writers are all of them kind of, you know, more or less, with the great writers are all more or less crazy. We, mm. Except, like, you know, I thought about Shakespeare. We know, nothing, we know nothing about him, so to some extent we think he must have been a very wonderful man, but he might not have been. What little we know is sometimes not always to his credit. One of, one of my favourite things in the book, John, was when you speculate about which was the first great author to use a typewriter, and you, you rather overturn Mark Twain's claim and, and plump for um, Friedrich Nietzsche. That's right. Yeah, he he. Uh, Nietzsche had what he called the Kugelschreiber, and um, mm. he very laboriously typed out something along the lines of, "This is bloody impossible to type with." <laughs> All <laughs> right with it, he went back to his uh, to his quill pen or whatever. No, they, um, typewriters are a big deal. I mean, sort of Hunter Thompson actually used to shoot them mm. with his other favourite sort of uh, <laughs> piece of machinery, namely the. Um, the, the Colt 45, mm. and you know, there's, 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 it's, it's quite a lot going on about this now because uh, Cormac McCarthy has uh, very recently decided that he's he's got a part with yes. Olivetti. What was interesting was that for a long time it was very, very kind of wrong, or sort of regarded as a, a not comical thing for for men to use typewriters. So mm. Henry James, even though he loved bicycles, mm. w- wouldn't actually soil his own fingers for the. <laughs> The QWERTY keyboard. He had the, the the majestic Theodora Bozanke, a secretary. <laughs> and one of the things that held back computers in the 1980s was that that bosses would, because they'd had female secretaries mm. who, who were typists and shorthand typists. Right? They, yeah, they wouldn't allow a keyboard into their office because, in fact, it, you know, it lowered their standing. It was unmanly. And, and that's right. Yeah, and, and that also was the case with authors. Except a lot of authors, actually, particularly authors who are trained in journalism, realise that you know, like like Hemingway, for instance, who was very big on typewriters, realised that you could actually take a portable typewriter to the front line of a war if you were reporting. Yes. It. Um, and that that was one of the breakthrough moments. But uh, it's very interesting. The history of the typewriter. There is one book which had been written on it, a rather good book called The Iron Whim. But. Um, uh, it, it, it's still, you know, how actually, how actually you get those words onto the onto the manuscript page, typescript page, is, is a very interesting subject. Or nowadays, of course, onto the hard disk. And one of the other facts I really loved was, you said someone had worked out that if you took all the characteristics of Proust's Madeleine, all as it was described in the book, you yeah. couldn't you couldn't actually reverse engineer it. There was there was no such real object which would have all those characteristics. I know. That's, that's exactly the kind of experiment which I haven't looked So yeah, because everyone knows about that. Even yeah, you know, people have never actually wouldn't even know how to spell Proust. You know about the the Madeleine, the cookie that he dunked in the uh, uh, in in the coffee and had brought back all his uh, all his childhood memories. But then some, <laughs> someone actually sort of <laughs> took the ingredients and, as you mm. say, reverse engineered it and discovered that such a, such a Madeleine could not exist. You know, it would be like a plaster of Paris or something. Mm. Or, I, I, the, the question that then arises is if you do that, what does it do to, you know, à la recherche du temps perdu? I mean, does it actually yeah. ruin the novel if you know that? Uh, are you, in fact, you know, are you deflating the, the, the balloon by, uh, or pinpricking the balloon by doing it? I don't think so. No, I think... In some ways, it just means that you're, you're really you're, you're, you're on the 
you're being alert, you know, you're, you're actually sort of doing what readers should do, you're actually mm. paying attention. Is there one literary puzzle or mystery that you would really love to crack that you, you feel you haven't, you haven't yet got, your, got a solution to? The, one, of the, one of the puzzles which, um, well, not puzzle, one, one of the curiosities which I, uh, I don't pursue because, in fact, I just raise it and then think about it, is, you know, readers' brains, or writers' brains, rather. Mm. And, um, you yeah, know, the Victorians, who, who are much less shy about such things as, than we are, used to weigh them. Mm. And they discover, you know, some writers have very heavy brains and others have brains which weren't so heavy. There's no correlation between the weight of the brain and the quality of the writing. But I would really like to know what goes on in the brain when you create this alternative world, which is what literature does. And mm. um, I've got great hopes that, um, that the new sort of, uh, you know, sort of imaging, magnetic imaging of, 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 of brain activity will tell us, you know, really something about, you know, what... What genius is, you know, mm. what in fact that magical thing that happens between between the you know the, the ears really really is, and who knows? I mean, it could be, it could be very soon. If, uh, but I, I will certainly award a Nobel Prize to the first scientist <laughs> who could tell me, you know, where is fancy bread and that kind of thing.